Well, howdy, y'all. It's me again. Why am I smiling so big? Because I ain't department chair no more. I'm hopeful we'll be able to get together like this more often now that I've retired mostly, at any rate, from my administrative duties. One of the first things I got to do after stepping down as chair was attend a summer workshop at something they call the Levi Institute. Got these while I was there. Well, ooh-wee, it was a time. The little woman and I got to conversate with so many other ranchers. Folks like uh, Stephanie Kelton, Pavlina Chernova, Rowan Gray, Randy Ray, Fidel Kaboob, Dimitri Papa Dimitrio, and many others. Hell, now and then we even talked about economics. I have to say the low light of the event was when Stephanie and I were partnered in pool and we were winning. And then I scratched on the eight ball. Honestly, given the general level of inebriation at that point, I'm not sure anyone would have noticed had I not pointed it out. But despite the color of this hat, we're the good guys. We're not the ones suggesting that the solution to the current bout of inflation is to further impoverish those most affected. You're thinking of mainstream economics. Speaking of inflation, and a lot of people are, there are so many terrible misunderstandings of the concept that I thought I would devote yet another video to it. So I want to break it down as follows. We're going to do four things to start off with. One, how the Consumer Price Index, or the CPI, the number we use to figure inflation, how it's calculated. How individual price changes affect the CPI, and including what can and cannot actually hurt you. What causes those individual price changes, and then at the end, how to control inflation. And after I'm done with all this, my hope is this, that the first thing you're going to realize is that, well, inflation's complicated. Thinking of it as a single number is not helpful. And furthermore, sometimes inflation is actually creating a socially useful outcome. We shouldn't do anything about it. And furthermore, regardless of what causes inflation, whether it be a war, profiteering, natural disaster, or $1,200 checks, the one thing that definitely doesn't help is raising interest rates in order to cause unemployment. That never, ever helps. Now, I'm trying to keep this relatively short, but there's a lot to be said because the confusion and misinformation is so widespread. So here we go. Part one, how CPI is calculated. Now, you may have noticed in the world that there isn't just one price. There's actually millions of them. So just what is it that the Consumer Price Index is measuring? Well, the Bureau of Labor Statistics surveys 24,000 people around the United States regarding their spending habits. And from this, they create what they call a representative basket of goods. Right now, that representative basket is roughly 40% housing, 15% food, 20% transportation, 10% medical care, and the remaining 15% spread across things like apparel, education, and recreation. So what they do is, they figure out how much everything in this basket costs, and then they reprice that basket every month to determine inflation from that. For example, what if they priced that basket and found out that everything in there cost $1,000? Then they checked again the next month, and it was $1,010. We'd say inflation was 1%, because the additional $10 is 1% of the original $1,000. And then the next month, we'd compare the cost of the basket of goods to the new value of 1010 and so on. That's how they come up with a number you hear called inflation. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to have to get a little complicated for just a minute, but this is something I think you really need to know. Always be sure to check to see if what you're looking at is annualized data or monthly data, all right? I've seen a lot of confusions with this in terms of unemployment and inflation data. It's very common for economists to express macroeconomic data, even if it's monthly or quarterly, in annualized terms. Or in other words, how much that value would have been had it continued at that rate for a whole year. It might be easiest to think of this in terms of one of the favorite sports here in God's country, baseball. Because we do something analogous to annualizing with pitchers numbers. For those of you unfamiliar with the greatest sport ever invented, you almost never keep the same pitcher in a game for the entire nine innings. One pitcher might pitch for five innings, another pitcher might pitch for a single inning, another pitcher might pitch for a fraction of an inning. How can we compare their performances if, let's say, all of them gave up a single run, well, which one of those is worse, which one of those is better in terms of the fact that they were in there for a different amount of time? Well, we standardize them. We use a statistic called the earned run average that gives us the average of what it would have been over the course of a nine inning game. So if a pitcher who only pitched for one inning gave up one run, they're going to get an ERA of nine because if they'd given up one run per inning for nine innings, it would have been nine runs. 
And, oh, there's a dog. Dog on it. Isn't it nice to debark right here in the middle of the first video I've done in months? Maybe he'll come in here and visit us in a minute. That's how much he would have allowed if his one inning performance had continued for nine innings. And, you know, another pitcher might have given up two runs over three innings. Get out your calculator there, you'll figure out, oh, that's an ERA of six. All these pitchers' performances are expressed in terms of what they would have done over an entire game. Well, we do the same thing for many macroeconomic statistics, only instead of using a game, we use a year. We annualize statistics. What if the economy had grown or shrunk or whatever at the rate in question for an entire year? All right, now, given all that, when you look up the inflation data on the Bureau of Labor Statistics webpage, and, and I'm, again, I'm sorry, this is a little bit tedious here, but, it, but it's really important. I want you to understand what you're looking at. Look here at the most recent announcement, all right? I, I printed it out. All right, so we have percentage change in CPI for all urban consumers, and I just wanted to focus in on, if it will, on that first line. Oh, that's the other hand over here, John. Uh, all items. All items at top line, let's go all the way over to the most recent number. For May, it's one, all right, one. So what it's saying is that from April to May, prices went up by 1%. And you might be thinking, well, that's not bad, 1%, shoot, that's all right. Yeah, no, 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 you gotta think of it in 12 months terms, all right? In fact, if you do the calculation, 1% for one month, it's gonna compound every month. So if it went up 1% from April to May, and then another 1% on top of that 1% from May to June, and another 1% on top of the 1% on top of the 1%, so on, you're gonna get 12.68% inflation. 12.68 is a hell of a lot higher than one. And those are the numbers we're all used to. We're all used to the annualized numbers. So when you initially look at this chart, you might think to yourself, well, shoot, that's not bad. It, it is, all right, it is. You've got to annualize it. Uh, my, myself, what I generally do is I just multiply by 10. Obviously, that's not the same thing, but you get a real quick sense of the, it'll be an underestimate, but you'll get a much better frame of reference. All right, so part one then. That's how they calculate it, and be sure you're looking at the annualized numbers, because those are the ones you usually hear on TV, and, and you're going to want to translate everything into the same language. What about changes in the Consumer Price Index? Well, while I was at that Levi Institute, a friend of mine and a well-known scholar said something real interesting. I don't have permission to quote him, so I'm not going to give an attribution, but what he said was, inflation's a made-up number. And that's right. I've never thought about saying it so boldly, though. And, and, and that's, I like that. He's right. We made it up. I don't mean to say that there's no logic behind it. That there's no reasoning behind it. I told you they did this big survey and everything to try to figure out what people knew and don't buy. But that's the point. We constructed it. It's not a number that exists in nature. That one number that we were given for inflation does not somehow exist in nature. We create an index. We create the basket of goods. And so therefore, if we changed how we constructed it, we would change inflation. For example, there's a great deal of evidence that during the height of COVID, the basket of goods that we were using was not very accurate compared to what people were actually buying. For example, the price of, of food in the home went up and the price of food uh, outside the home went down, but ain't nobody going to have food outside the home. So really the fact that that went down, even though it got calculated in the CPI and made the CPI not go up as much, even though the cost of restaurant food went down, we weren't really going out to restaurants anymore, right? So um, this sort of thing can happen. Again, it's not to say that it's meaningless, but we should be very careful regarding what meaning we read into a single number. This is why you absolutely positively always must break it down into the component categories before you can really get a handle on what's going on. For example, June 2021 CPI, it indicated that the overall inflation rate for that month was, in annualized terms, 11%. Know what used car prices did that month? They rose at an annualized rate of 231% in that month, all right? And indeed, the report went on to say that those overall prices, that 11%, uh, the increase in used cars was over one-third of that. The increase in used cars was over one-third of that 11%. Well, now, I was not then, nor am I now, in the market for a used car. Hence, my inflation was considerably lower than the rate quoted by the BLS. On the other hand, if I'd had an old beat-up car on its last legs, then even if other prices were stable, or perhaps even falling so that the overall inflation rate was quite low, I'm screwed. I gotta go buy a new car that's done gone up 231% in annualized terms. So the important lesson is, 
always, always, always double check on the Bureau of Labor Statistics webpage to see the breakdown. Again, I don't know how much focus is going to be, but, but this is what you find if you search for BLS CPI. Look down the page there, and uh, on the uh, left over there, it's all broken down by category, all right? So you read through that, you get a much better sense of what's going on. I understand why they do it as one number, um, but you got to remember where that one number came from. Now, here's something else to bear in mind. Some of these prices are largely independent of the others. They go up, and that's it. They go up. Apparel, for example, is a category here. Probably has some spillover into the other categories, but nothing terribly significant. Energy, however, affects damn near everything else. If the cost of gasoline goes up, at the very least, that raises the cost of transporting any of the other items on the list. And nearly all of the other items on the list have to be transported at some stage. Therefore, there's every reason to believe that the inflation that is occurring right now in energy prices is bleeding into virtually every other price you see, just as it did back in the 1970s and 80s with OPEC oil embargoes. Right. So, we have how it's calculated, uh, how to think about the individual price changes and how they feed into other categories and whether or not they're going to hurt you or not. Topic three, what causes inflation? Well, first and foremost, there is no cause of I'm going to do these little air quote things I see people do all the time. Inflation, all right? Only causes of individual prices being changed, all right? Uh, let me say it again. There's no, and there's no such thing as, oh, I got my script right here in front of me, and it literally says, let me say that again. I didn't even remember that. There is no cause of inflation, only causes of changes in the individual prices of products in the various sectors represented by the consumer price index. And by the way, this suggests that perhaps since there isn't just one cause of inflation, there might not be just one solution. Indeed. Now, let's think through what can happen. I'm going to give you five different possibilities of how one of them prices could go up, like price of used cars or price of energy or whatever. First one I'm going to call acts of God, which seems really cruel to God because these are all bad things. Right? Natural disasters, uh, wars, that sort of thing. These can drive up costs and therefore prices. Ever heard of COVID? A study by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis concluded that the impact of the pandemic on supply chains was unprecedented. In 2021, producers' costs rose by around 30 percent. And roughly two thirds of that, they figured, was just from supply chain issues. Just from that. Now, who caused that? Well, uh, sorry, but you know. Uh, same sort of thing done happened when Hurricane Katrina hit and when Putin invaded Ukraine. That's the first category, acts of God. Second one, profits inflation. Adam Smith's ideal version of capitalism pictured firms in a highly competitive environment going at each other's throats to try to get you to spend your money for their product. Well, we've seen a steady increase in industrial concentration uh, concentration since the Reagan-Thatcher era. And if firms have the power to raise their profit margins, this means raising prices and causing inflation. In 1973, OPEC, their control of the market for oil allowed them to restrict the supply and drive up the prices drastically. And right now, we see frequent mention of the possibility that at least some and perhaps a lot of what we are witnessing is merely firms raising their markup and therefore their profits. How? Because they face so little competition. Hell, I even saw a piece in The Economist, which is a fairly right-leaning publication, talking about how much more concentrated the industries have become all over the world since the Reagan-Thatcher era. So that's profits inflation. The labor equivalent of that is wage inflation. If labor is sufficiently strong relative to capital, and again, think of this in, the, in terms of individual sectors. It never happens everywhere at once, right? Um, if labor is sufficiently strong relative to capital, it can command wages in excess of its productivity. Fortunately, we haven't had to worry about that in years. Labor is as weak as a kitten. Hooray! Thank you, Reagan Thatcher. Fourth, inflation can be injected from financial markets. The CPI inflation does not include things like stock prices. It's just goods and services, but there can be a relationship. Take, for example, what happened in the aftermath of President Clinton signing into law the Commodity Futures Modernization Act in December of 2000. Apparently, the thought back then was that there's not nearly enough speculation in the financial market. So let's get some more in here. And therefore, one of the things this act accomplished was to inject new demand into oil futures. Now, previously, this had been dominated by the actual end users of the oil and was therefore pretty closely tied to the actual needs of the end users. But thanks to the gentleman who brought us ending welfare as you know it, now every Tom, Dick, and Morgan Stanley combined, right? And they did. 
they drove up the price of the futures. And now imagine you're a rancher out there in Saudi Arabia and you're thinking about how much of your oil to pump out of the ground. And you're looking at the futures price jump way up and you're thinking, ooh wee, why pump this out of the ground now when the market says it'll be worth more in the future? So I'm not going to pump as much out right now, which drives up the current price of oil. So people bidding up the futures price drove up the current price. And voila, that's French, say those who, were brought, who had bought all those futures, we was right. The price did go up. Let's buy some more. And the cycle continues. You may have noticed gas prices going up right now. It is estimated that approximately 25% of that is simply a result of speculation of this exact process I just described. And remember what I said earlier about how energy prices impact almost every other sector of the economy. But hey, who am I to begrudge rich folks a place to park their savings? Fifth and last I'm going to talk about here is the inflation causing factor that is demand, what we call demand pull inflation. It's quite popular right now in some circles to argue that this is what has caused our recent increase in prices. Those incredibly generous $1,200 checks handed out in the summer of 2020 led people to go out and go absolutely insane buying extravagances like food, used cars, and fuel oil. Well, let's say that's true. It's not. It's exceedingly clear that the supply chain issues caused by COVID and the oil price increases spurred by the invasion of Ukraine and speculation in the futures are clearly to blame. But let's play along for a minute, Larry Summers. Something I haven't mentioned so far is not only is it necessary to consider which specific prices are rising when considering inflation, but inflation always redistributes income. If you're paying more, somebody's getting more. And unless the prices they pay are rising faster than the ones that represent their income, this can be a net gain for them. Take the example of OPEC raising prices after the 73 Arab-Israeli war. It resulted in a terrible bout of inflation that lasted a little over a decade. And everyone on the planet was worse off. Wait a minute, that, that can't be true, can it? Because it's quite clear that the oil exporting countries and the oil industry absolutely gained at others' expense. Now, I'm not saying that's always a bad thing. It's just another consideration. You have to stop and think who is getting better off and who is getting worse off. And sometimes we might actually be okay with who's getting better off. And that's especially the case with this demand pull inflation. Think about it. If consumer demand is outstripping supply, this means that consumers want more of the product in question. Let's say it's umbrellas. It also means that the prices and profits in the umbrella industry are likely to rise. Therefore, the demand pull inflation increases the incomes of those creating the stuff people want, in this case umbrellas. And this will induce those in the umbrella industry to make more of the product in question, and it might even attract new firms to the umbrella industry. Well, hell, that's what the consumers wanted. The consumers wanted more, and because this created a windfall for that industry, consumers got more. Good deal. This is the kind of thing Adam Smith had in mind, and there's no reason to stop it. Of all the ironies that the Federal Reserve, this is the one time they step in and screw with the economy is when it's actually doing something useful, but I'll come back to that in a second. During the oil crisis years, the demand for, for ceiling fans, which I have one over me right now because it's over 100 degrees here in Texas. The demand for ceiling fans shot up as households wanted to find cheaper ways to keep their homes cool. This raised prices and profits, and more ceiling fans got made. At the start of COVID, back when we thought maybe you could catch it off of surfaces, the demand for medical alcohol shot up, and so did their prices and profits. Shockingly, this led to more medical alcohol being produced, which is what we wanted. Hell, even folks who were generally just making liquor, which also became popular during COVID, got in on the act. Now, there's certainly a case for subsidies or price controls or the like if these prices in question are basic human needs like housing, and we gotta consider the people on fixed incomes. But otherwise, inflation resulting from rising demand is performing an important social function. It is serving as a signal to entrepreneurs regarding what consumers want. Leave it alone. Yes, Larry Summers, I'm talking to you. Part four, last part, how to control inflation. Now, obviously, how to control inflation is a function of what's causing it. And as you can see, there is no one size fits all solution. If it's profit inflation, attack the firm's market power. If it's wage inflation, see to it that workers aren't being rewarded out of proportion to their productivity. If it's inflation fueled by the financial market speculation, get a time machine, go back in time and make sure that President Clinton can't find a pen to sign the Commodity Futures Modernization Act into law. 
if it's COVID or the invasion of Ukraine, well, we figured out what we can do to ease the situation. With, with COVID, you know, uh, um, uh, we, of course, we sent out the checks and so forth and find ways to create more masks and, and, and so on. But obviously very, very specific to the incident itself. And if it's demand pull, nine times out of ten, we should do absolutely nothing. Conclusion. In closing, I think you will have noticed two things here. First of all, inflation cannot be understood as just one number. You have to figure out what's driving it, where it's concentrated, which sector, how likely it is to have spillover effects, who's being hurt, who's being helped. Like Johnny Depp's relationship status is complicated. But everything regarding inflation isn't complicated. Here's something simple. Here's something crystal clear. There is no form of inflation that is solved by raising interest rates or inducing a recession. Not a single one. Not profits inflation, not wage inflation, not external shock COVID inflation, not financial market induced inflation, not demand pull inflation. Well, yes, demand pull, but it doesn't need to be solved. So what we're doing today in terms of inflation fighting policy makes no sense and it can only make things worse. As if you needed another reason to be depressed. Sorry about that.